Tony and Gary, thanks so much for having a chat with thanks us today. Thanks for having us. Cheers. Um, all five original Spandau Ballet band members are in Australia right now for a big Australian mm -hmm. tour. What have you guys got in store for us this time around? Well, last time we were here was five years ago. Obviously, it, it's well documented in our documentary, Subways of the Western World. We had a big breakup for about 19 years. Got together back in 2009, 2010. Brilliant show, great show. I think this time around, I think we're even more relaxed in each other's company. And I think the show is actually better than it was last year. We've been getting, you know, five star reviews, and uh, and we just we just love playing live. I think we love we love playing live more now than we ever yeah. did before. Yeah, this, is been, this, this is the best show we've ever done. Musically, mm. we're better, and uh, the crowds are responding really well. I think we put a lot into it. There's bits of the film that's incorporated incorporated into the show as well. Um, but musically, just a lot more expansive mm. and just a lot more relaxed. And We're incredibly confident on yeah. stage. I think there's a, there's a sort of, and there's you know it's not choreographed as such. It's just but there's there's an empathy between us that just works so well. Nice one. And do you play? And new... we're naked, of course, which is everyone knows. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know that. I've got a story. No, no that's another show. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I was going to say, can we film? Um, and do you play new material these days yeah, as well? Uh, we've got three new songs, yeah. um, uh, which we uh, produced with Trevor Horn. Uh, last year mm -hmm. and are on the uh, the new Greatest Hits album, The Story. Um, and we're really proud of those songs, actually. They sound great, really work well. They're very Spandau, mm -hmm. but uh, I think they're some of the best recordings really, we've ever really done. Good, yeah. yeah, so, we, you know, and they fit in well with all the uh, the old stuff, too. You first came to Australia in 1985 and you yeah. were on Countdown at that time. Oh, with Molly. With Molly. With Molly. Yeah. Yeah, what yeah, what yeah. can you remember from that experience? <laughs> Molly was a card. Uh, you know, he is. We saw at the races last... We did. We saw him did at we, the yeah. races. Yeah, yeah. We were uh, we promoting the film. You know, we had a party time here. It was amazing. You know, there, there's quite a bit of it in the film of us arriving in, yeah. in Australia. Bands didn't used to come to Australia that much in the 80s. And, uh, you know, it was a sort of... Uh, but it was an amazing experience coming here. And there was a Massive. lot of parties. Oh, there's a lot and, of parties. Uh, it was... We felt a long way from home, but at the same time, as you always do when you're in Australia, you feel very at home. I mean, unusually for bands. I mean, normally you see you know, the airport, the hotel, the venue, and it's the same, it's Groundhog Day. But we toured Europe, I remember, for something like two months with two days off and we, in the winter, and we were wiped out. And in Australia, we had 10 days off to do as you will, which was fantastic. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, and and my, my, my son, who's near 31, took his first little steps at the Siebel Townhouse, the Rock and Roll Hotel, when he was just one. So a very, very good memory. Lovely. Yeah, it's nice. Spandau Ballet um, emerged as part of the new romantic movement in the late 70s, early 80s. Now, there's a generation of our audience who won't know what that means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was um, New Romanticism well, all about? you know, it came out of a little club in London, uh, a club that got taken over on a Tuesday night uh, by Steve Strange and Rusty Egan, a couple of young guys uh, playing electronic dance music. Um, and it was called The Blitz, this place. So we got in, ended up being called The Blitz Kids, which I think we still are. To a certain extent, a lot of very, very creative people mm. came out of that tiny little Tuesday night club, and, and we became the house band. And there was a sort of long history of this happening in in the UK ever since the Two Eyes Club with with rock and roll in the late fifties, um, the Marquee Club in the seventies with the Who, and um, the UFO Club uh, in the late sixties with um, with Pink Floyd. You know, it's what it's what the Brits do. Youth culture, pop culture, a place. And mm -hmm. the New Romantics were the sort of movement after punk, really. And and we we were the band. Amazing, that amazing that. time. And what I mean, what was interesting because people say, you know, do you think that could happen now with the internet, the you know, the world media as it is? And no, there there was a, there was a kind. It was almost like a secret society, you know. And um, you had someone like Steve Strange, bless him, who uh, a great friend who recently died. And he was on the door saying, no, you can come in. You don't look quite so cool. <laughs> I mean, at one point, he actually turned he turned away Mick Jagger. And I was like, why did you do that? I, wanted, I really wanted to meet Mick Jagger, you know? Yeah, but this wasn't a club like Studio 54. It wasn't full of rich kids at all. In fact, yeah. everyone was either a poor student or even a poorer student or not a student like yeah. us. Working class lads just trying to get by. And everyone was doing it on a shoestring. So they'd be um, making their own clothes. They'd be finding stuff in thrift stores. Um, and, and it was a kind of, wasn't really a specific look, it was, but it was definitely outrageous. Yep. And I think really um, mm. we took our lead because in 72, 73, you know, we probably all fell in love with David Bowie and we saw the theatre of rock and roll as being something that you, you know, you had to look otherworldly 
to to be on stage that's, or, that's or even to walk do. down the street as a kid. Yeah. I mean, when you're 19 and 20 years of age or 18 or whatever, you want to shock your parents. You don't want your parents to go, oh, you look nice tonight, love. You know, you want them to be outraged. And that's that's what it was all about. We were young kids and we wanted to make great music that was different from everybody else and look differently as well. Some of those outfits and hairstyles were yeah. very awesome. Yeah. Did you style yourselves? No, it was it was all street fashion. That was the interesting. I mean, eventually, well, yeah, I mean, we didn't have did. someone telling us what to wear. If yeah. that's what it was all it was all what was just happening on the street. It was I mean, in the clubs, you know, there was the Blitz and there was Billy's and then there was La Beat Root and La Kilt and those clubs influenced the various fashion sort of stances that came after that. I mean, eventually, it went high street. I mean, by the mid '80s, yeah. it was frilly shirts well, and every Princess Diana. It, the whole thing had gone kind of global. That's right. Nice one. Um. How fierce was the rivalry with other bands at the time, like, you know, Duran Duran? Do you know, do you know it was at the time? I remember because I remember when Geldof set, saw me the day after he saw the uh, documentary, uh, the news report on Ethiopia on, uh, on BBC, and he said, do you think we can make a record? And I didn't, because I thought, there's no way that Boy George and us uh, and Duran are all going to get together in the same room and, uh, and do this, because we were in competition in the charts for certain um, but of course it came together and um, you know actually that night before we'd mm. recorded the Band Aid record we met Duran for the first time on all our travels apart from when we very first but met when them the in, rum Birmingham, in Birmingham yeah. at the Rum Runner we didn't even know they were in a band um, and that was a drinking competition and that was a, yeah, that was that was a different, drinking competition that was a different competition um, <laughs> and so, so I think the rivalry was there for certain, and I think it was good and it was healthy because it made everyone try and make better records. Better it was just videos. competitive, you know. It was just, just yeah. great. I mean, it was very, whether it was Frankie Goes to Hollywood or Culture Club or Ultravox or Duran Duran, but we're all great friends. I mean, the charts were a bit like mm. a football league at that yeah. time. You know, everyone wanted to, to be number one and win the championship. Cool. Um, I think you guys were winners, though, in terms of <laughs> Well, thank you very much. From I mean, my, my we'll personal take that one. opinion. Um, you had eight UK top ten albums, um, and you were definitely one of the defining Maybe acts. Maybe we have, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Including yeah, yeah. You had eight UK it. top ten yeah. albums, and you were one of the defining acts of the wow. 80s. How did your lives change when True came out? Oh, um, I mean, you, you've got to imagine, I mean, Gary touched on the whole Blitz and Billy's thing and the electronica. And, you know, we were very much a cult band, really before the True album. Uh, and Gary said many times, you know, we wanted, we wanted to be a big, bigger band. And the songs that Gary started to write were sort of almost songs that were gonna propel us into bigger arenas. And when True went to number one in 21 countries around the world, I mean, you know, wow, we were 23. Yeah. Um, what an amazing time. I was still living at home. <laughs> yeah. But Martin and I were still living at home with our parents in a council house. And uh, a cup of tea, dear. It was, and I wrote that <laughs> album, you know, in my bedroom with my mum shouting, come on down, your dinner's ready, you know, and stuff like that. You know, it's extraordinary. It changed our lives and it gave us, um, you know, we, we became part of the of the second British invasion, uh, along with Human League and Duran. Um, I think what we didn't realise at that point was that it was going to be, uh, uh, it was going to surpass all of our expectations mm. and become a record would still be, hearing on the radio in Samples, 32 years' on time. films, everything. Yep. And also, we went from a cult band to being a, a, a basically a teen scream band. I mean, you know, when we came to Australia, I mean, we couldn't leave the hotel. There were two or three hundred kids just going bananas outside, you know. So I the whole emphasis always, of the band sort of changed, really. You know, it? it's an interesting thing, because there was, a, there was an element of us that, you know, where you go from being a cult band to, to having, like Tony said, the scream thing happening, um, which was happening to a lot of... Mm. bands at that time mm. where part of you thinks but oh you're listening to the music and I you know I still want you know we and we we were proud of what we did we wrote it all we played it all we we devised the look of the band we devised the look of the videos you know we were not you know people have kind of forgotten because of the way music has become that there were no Svengartis there were no you know powerful older blokes telling us what to do and pushing us around and we were very much in charge of our creativity right did did that rock star lifestyle you know of the booze and the coke and all of that did that take its toll i gotta say we you know listen we're a band that liked to drink and everything else and we parted with the best of them but we the, the, i think the great thing about span now is that we've got great family great friends uh and, 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 and within ourselves we would never allow any one of us to, be, for, for, you know, to become, 
you know, uh, a drunkard or dependent or coke addicted or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that just wasn't, you know, we're kind of very protective. But like I say, on the outside of the band, there was a lot of support from family and friends as well. You know, I think our parents, you know, working class mm. parents, you know, my dad got up every day to go and work in a print factory and put a tie and jacket on. Um, and I think they showed us uh, how, you know, that you've got to work hard to make these things happen. And, uh, and as Tony said, you know, we've always put work first and play second. Yeah, and, what, and the thing is, as we, you know, if your dream is to be on top of the pops and playing all over the world, you know, why do you want to squander that? Mm -hmm. it's, it's mindless. And I mean, I see, you see bands that get into these addictions and stuff, and, and it's, it's like, just enjoy it. I think, I think what it's took great. its toll, and you can see it in the movie, is the work, you know, the, yeah. the work took its toll. We were, you know, we were flying everywhere, working a lot, and, um, and there was a lot of pressure to, to keep up. And of course, right behind us, towards the end of the 80s, <clears> came the next wave of youth culture, which was, which was the dance scene mm. and the DJ culture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and there comes a time when, when you're not flavor of the month, you know. And, and I think that, accompanied by all the pressures of work, and, and, and gradually got us to, to you know, go in slightly different directions and then, yeah. Unfortunately, not get back together for a hell of a long time. Yeah. Twenty years. Yeah. Yeah. What well, What does that feel like when you're not the flavor of the month all of a sudden? Because you know your body produces chemicals mm. when you're winning at anything, yeah. but yeah. when that's removed, how, what effect does that have? Well, I mean, it, it, how we had a couple of minor blips in in our early part of our career. I mean, our first single, to cut long story short, which was a hit in Australia, uh, top five in the UK, you know, wow, euphoria, it's amazing, here we are. Mm. And then all of a sudden the second singer I remember was The Freeze only went to number 17. And already the pundits were out. We told you they were only one hit wonders. <laughs> Actually, uh, our know, review for Cut Long Story Short in the NME said, uh, over by Christmas. <laughs> oh yeah, yes. <laughs> so, so when the second single wasn't like, you know, matching to Cut Long Story Short, there were people going, yeah, I told you so. But, you know, you, you want it so much. Every artist wants it so much to see, you, you, you don't want to see any down parts. You've got to maintain it. Yeah. It's very difficult. I mean, you know, even now, you know, you, you still want the people to come and see you, you still want the accolades and the good reviews. You know, I think yeah. the good thing about Spandau Split, if you like, in many ways, is that we never had a, a, a long fallow period of going bad. Yep. You know, we, uh, we really encapsulated that decade. And when we did come back, you know, mm. um, there was a feeling of unfinished business. Yep. Um, and there was an excitement about it because we, we represented so much of what was good about the music that came out of that golden age. Mm. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the band did split in 1990 and the documentary kind of suggests that your ego might have had something to do Me, with yeah, it. Personally. How do you feel about <laughs> that time now? Well, listen, I think there was a way of painting that story and, and George Henkin, the director, chose that route. And I was quite happy with that because there's an element of me that was a very controlling person. Um, you know, I was the songwriter at that time, and but then I defended that position as well, probably out of fear to a certain extent, you yeah. know, because you don't want someone to come along and do something better than you. Um, but, you know, I'm proud of that guy as well. You know, he was, he, you know, he had a, a driving instinct to do something and, and it certainly worked. Um, but then again, I'm not, you know, he's someone else. You know, he didn't know my four kids. He hasn't yeah. become the man that I've become. So, um, yet. And, and I think, um, you know, it's good and bad in that guy. Yeah. I think, to be honest, we have been very, very honest with the film and, and with George Henkin, who's a lady director, by the way. She's fantastic. Oh. With, the, with the archive footage that she had, we, we spent hours talking to her about what our view of the band was, about being in the band, about the breakup, who we thought were the responsible parties and everything else. And we were brutally honest in, in, our, in our discussions with her. It's mm -hmm. almost like very expensive therapy, <laughs> you know. And, um, but from those conversations, she put together what she thought would make a great documentary. Yeah. If we'd have got involved in the editing, you know, Gary certainly would have gone, I don't like that bit, I don't like that. You know, I would have gone, oh, I hate that. There's sections in it there where I, I hate certain bits of the film. Yeah. But it's, it's honest. And I think the, the, the critics, have, that's what they've yeah, liked about it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. You know, I think actually the film doesn't say that ego broke up the band. I think there's 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 a, there's someone says something like that in the film. I think what what for me, you know, there's a bit when I didn't want to do it anymore, and I didn't want to do it anymore because I probably brought this pressure upon myself of being the only songwriter. Yeah. And I felt that pressure, and also because I think the machinery uh, 
doesn't really respect any of your time off, your privacy. Yeah. It just thinks, right, well, let's just keep working them. Let's just keep working mm. them, you know? Yeah. And we're, we're, we were in charge of ourselves. We were as equally as to blame. And something breaks in the end. And I think we all needed some time off. Unfortunately, that time went on and on and on. Uh, but I think yeah, if we'd said, let's take a few, let's take a couple of years off and, and then come back again and, and think about what we want to do, I think it might have been different. I mean, yeah. hindsight's a great thing. And I, I said, you know, said to Gary, said in interviews before, that really th after through the barricades, we just said, right, lads, let's take five years off. Yeah. Let's go off and do our various things. Because we, we, I think that was at that point, yeah. we realised that making the final album, Heart Like a Sky, was a massive mistake, huge mistake. And we should have really taken five years off. But hindsight's a great thing. But then if we hadn't have done that, we wouldn't have the documentary and we wouldn't be yep. here today. Well, so. funny enough, we're doing a couple of songs from that album on this tour and they've really worked out well. But I okay. think, you know, in, uh, once the emotions have been taken away from uh, from that album and we look back and we've seen, well, there's a, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a track on there called Empty Spaces, which I think is one of the best vocals mm. that yeah. Tony's done. And we're, oh, thanks, we're enjoying that a lot on this tour. We're also doing a great bit in the show which we all yeah. love which is a sort of the medley of the bit. first album very electronica cool. the back to the blitz club and that's going down a storm that's great it's my favorite bit yep um tony the documentary covers this so i have to ask it yeah. um it got to the point where you and a couple of the other band members took gary to court mm. over songwriting royalties how did it get to that point oh things just things just escalate i mean you know it's, it's in the film i'm not going to go on about it now i mean things things just happen uh, sometimes you maybe need to take a deep breath and everything else, but it's 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 weird. Things just happen and they they have a habit of rolling on. And um, yeah, do you know what? We, sh story. we should never have got to that point. It's, really. it's our story, and we wouldn't have had such a good film probably without yes. it. <laughs> so we don't regret where we are at all. In fact, we're very happy about where we are because we resolved our differences yeah. and we embraced each other as friends and respect each other for mm. the fact that we don't we're only here because of each other. Yeah. Um, so I think we're not in denial of Spandau Ballet anymore, mm -hmm. and that you know we made something that uh, has got a legacy that when we're dead and buried is still going to be known about, yeah. and so we're proud of that, <laughs> you know. So I mean, you know, it, it's it's I I think I've said in many interviews that you carry a lot of anger and angst around with you when you're sort of you know I mean I, how many times did. We, we didn't talk to each other. We didn't have anything to do with each other. I said, when hell freezes over, to quote the Eagles. And we're probably the longest band that actually st stayed apart. Um, you know, but it, it's a great relief when we finally sort of said, right, can we make this work again? And then let's try and move forward. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tremendous relief. It's good to relief. know that hell's frozen over because I was really worried about going there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about the UK election a little bit on our show. Um, how do you guys feel with the recent results? I'm over the moon, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're divided on our politics, right. that's good. That's what makes us a good team. Yeah, yeah, you are quite... We're a coalition in pop music. <laughs> you you are quite a vocal supporter of the Conservative yeah. Party. Why do well, you... Gary's very vocal about Labour. We, we, we've we always had this, you know, it's just like chalk and cheese sometimes, right, me and him, you know. Yeah. Ask and but... But yeah, no, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a conservative. I mean, very few people in the media actually say they are, but, you know, mm. I stand up and count myself as a conservative, yeah. That's interesting, I think. There's not that many kind of, like, out, if that's the right word, out sort of right-wing rock stars. Time. <laughs> Why do you think there's not many people who are, you know, vocal? Well, in it's, I don't know. It's sometimes, I think it's incredibly fashionable to say, yeah, I, I'm a socialist and I care about this and I care about that. I care about everybody. I mean, I'll help anybody on the street, whatever. And I believe that, you know, proper conservatism is is something that, that, that we do help people. But we also have to take hard choices as well. And, you know, you know, Britain's, we're just coming out of a pretty horrible time. And um, I think people have taken the, 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 the view that look steady as she goes and let's keep a steady ship and see what happens. I mean, you know, I, I just, I don't blindly follow politics and agree with what every politician says. I, I just hope that they do things for the good of the country. That's yeah. all I care about is our country. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think Labour had it right at all. Um, you know, I would prefer a Labour government, but I don't think they had it right. Um, and mm. I think um, they uh, uh, they were missing out a huge part of their vote by ignoring them. And um, and then, you know, I was never really comfortable totally with Ed. And uh, but I think um, you know, hopefully we won't tear ourselves apart now trying to make it better. Cool. You also have the best of album out at the moment. Yeah. I, I'm keen to hear from both of you what's your favourite song on the album. 
my, well, my favourites. I mean, I love the three new songs. Absolutely brilliant. Really proud of them. But if we're going to go back, it'd have to be Through the Barricades. I think it's the best song. I love the lyric. Uh, I love the subtlety from a vocalist point of view. And then when you get to the big, the drums are coming in and it kicks in, it goes rocky. Yeah. It's just anthemic. It's fantastic. Nice you, one. you know, it's like picking one of your favourite children, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it's very hard to do, you know, seriously. You know, I'm proud of, I'm proud of what we've done, you know. It. There's a bunch of songs out there that's it. You know, as a whole, it makes sense. You know, it's difficult to, to focus in on one. I mean, I, I tend to agree with Tony as a songwriter's point of view. But, um, you know, Cut Long Story Short still makes it. And chart number one. I love that playing that too. Good. I mean, they all sound great, but Barricades for me is the best. Cool. Thank you so much for Thank having a chat. It's been lovely Cheers. meeting you. Thank you, Angie.